Y'all know me. Know how I earn a living. This shark swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell, Charge, we've got a panel on our hands on the 4th of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn. I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. No, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. Once more in the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you very much for returning for another episode. This episode is going to be episode 52, Jaws Context. What is context, and how does it apply to the movie Jaws? So episode 52 here is almost going to work as a prequel, in many ways, to episode 51, which was Jaws Subtext. And what we're going to prove today is that subtext, you cannot have subtext without context. They're both one and the same. Context will lead to more subtext. So when in the last episode, if you haven't listened to that, you can go ahead and listen to that. You don't need to. Both these episodes will play off of each other. So episode 52 now is Jaws Context, where we are going to explain what Jaws does so well to lead to the subtextual significance of many scenes in the movie. Okay, so episode 50 and 51, we set some ratings records here for the Jaws Obsession over the last two weeks. The listenership has never been stronger for the Jaws Obsession, and I want to thank everyone for returning and for doing your part in letting other Jaws fans know that we have a pretty significant operation going on here in regards to not just uh, the analytics of Jaws, but also what we are trying to do in advancing the Jaws universe. And the last two episodes, 50 and 51, led to the highest total uh, downloads by two episodes in the history of the show. I mean, we're, we've only been around, we've only been out for over a year now, but both episodes combined for almost 1,000 downloads between the two on podcast platforms and YouTube. At the same time, the show registered over 2,000 downloads altogether. That is a very, very, very significant total, for, and it's the highest ever that we've achieved. So that lets us know that uh, there are new listeners coming to the show every day. The audience is expanding in that more Jaws fans are finding out about just what we set out to do when episode 20 was revealed that it all starts with a book. That is it possible to get the studio system to actually expand the Jaws universe and increase the enjoyment of Jaws. Every little sign like this, like I saw with the totals of episode 50 and 51, it's inspiring to keep pushing forward and keep moving ahead. Uh, we have to thank Marty Milner once more with that boost of downloads and interest. He had a stellar interview in episode 50 where there were many details on the production of Jaws that were revealed. It's safe to say that even the most experienced of Jaws fanatics, you would have learned something in episode 50 because there was a lot that was passed off. I still smile when I think about that interview and what it did for the show, 
but also what it did to galvanize fans together from the comments I saw that were left on the YouTube version of the show and also from the emails that I got in that uh, Marty Milner's presence it brought some more listeners into the bubble and uh, his five-star review for the Book of Quint was um, a turning point, I think. When it goes to a larger publishing house, I will not deny that an editor will have to do a careful edit on the book. It's still... There is, uh, There are some typos in there still that got through. Believe me, it's just impossible. 140,000 words. I still wake up at night and think that I screwed up a date or a time or a name and flip through the book. It's just one of those things where it's. I, I was doing that for so long that it kind of. it's kind of ingrained inside me to keep looking and keep looking. It will be nice to have extra eyes on it. I am fairly positive that the uh, the version that will be released next when there is a wide release of the book of quint th- there will be minor changes not not massive changes there's no there aren't going to be any extra scenes or pages lopped off it's just little structural polishes that have to go on okay and of course that will have to be done in a later time but as it stands after the marty milner review and that episode 50, and it gets the point across that this is a real story, this is a real prequel to Jaws, and that we are in a very, very good spot here. Now, one of the many overall goals, if you can, if everyone can just take that bird's eye view and just fly up in the air and just look at the entire process of what we have going on. This is an opportunity that further generations will be able to enjoy the movie like never before because this is a second chance for Universal Studios to put the movie on its proper pedestal where it belongs. If the book were to advance into a feature film, what you would have is you would have two, possibly three, full-scale screen-used orcas built for the filming, which could then be made into floating museums where they could be taken care of, preserved, and then visited by generations of fans to come. What I would like to see would be a Jaws Preservation Society made and established on Martha's Vineyard. I would like to see these locations taken care of. There are locations that are on Martha's Vineyard that are either crumbling or they are risk development erasing at this point. There are no plaques to honor what took place at some of these locations. There's just word of mouth, YouTube videos, or you could just go ask around. Of course, there's the Edgartown Tour Company with Mike Currid. That he is invaluable over there. But for the most part, there's certain areas of that island that should have some sort of notice or plaque, and it should just be established that something great took place at these locations, that great men and women walked these areas and made this movie a possibility. And that's what we are talking about a half a century later. We all know, if you listen to episode 19 of The Jaws Obsession, the fate of the orca, what happened, how they treated the orca, and to Steven Spielberg's disappointment of how it was destroyed, this is a chance to actually right all of those wrongs and actually make something that's constructive. Now, what I've always admired, one of my favorite actors of all time is Jimmy Stewart. When I went to the Jimmy Stewart Museum, it's in Indiana, Pennsylvania, it's his hometown, what I always admired was that, I believe it was Warner Brothers, he was a contract actor with Warner Brothers, they ponied up the cash, and they they helped create this museum, of which it's just... It's just one floor. It's just a small little place where you can go look at, you can go see his Oscar, some of the costumes from some of his films, pictures. It's in his hometown. It's right down the street from the hardware store where he worked at, his father's hardware store where he worked at when he was a boy. But there's a little cinema there and it screens Jimmy Stewart movies very regularly. So you can go in there and you see It's a Wonderful Life or Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Basically, Warner Brothers financed that and, and set it up, and now it's maintained by, I think, the Jimmy Stewart Foundation. So it maintains itself. What I would like to see happen is Universal does the same thing with the movie Jaws. It can happen. It's just there has to be the will of it to happen. And it can't just be a Jaws fest every five, ten years. This could be this could lead to something that's very real. It's not something that is exploiting the movie, it's celebrating the movie. 
It's celebrating the achievements of the people that worked on that movie. It's celebrating what that movie means to people all around the world. And for that to happen, this is an actual possibility. This is the one time we have. This is this is right now. We are in this. We are in the Peter Benchley timeline. Uh, January of 1973, he was finishing the manuscript for Jaws. Well, we have a as as far as we're concerned, this is the finished, completed manuscript. It's a it uh, the novel of the Book of Quint is out, and now we just need to follow those steps. Everybody from around the world make the noise, the necessary noise, so that we know that that this can is a very big possibility that this could lead to some great things, and that's what I see this happening. It's not just a book. It's not just a potential movie. There's much more here in terms of legacy and honoring the legacy of Jaws. And that's what we're looking at. So if everyone keeps that in proper perspective, keep the scope of this project in proper perspective, it's hard not to support this. So that's what I'm asking is not just the current followers of the Jaws Obsession or the Book of Quint, but maybe some of the Jaws fans out there that have been a little reluctant to jump on board. Or maybe some of the people out there that have a little bit of more influence in the Jaws world or the shark world or the publishing world to start talking about it as we all can come together and we can do great things here. Something very, very amazing can come out of this. That's my vision and that's what I'm seeing. And I think that we are still on, we are on target for that. And it's, it's, it's exciting to see. So I want to thank everybody for not just making episodes 50 and 51, the highest two weeks of uh, ratings on the Jaws Obsession for the last two weeks. Uh, Those two episodes combined for over two hours of listening time, two and a half hours. Thank you for your time. That's a lot of Jaws fans that are spending time here in the Jaws Obsession and taking time out of their day. And I want to thank you for that. We're celebrating our favorite movie of all time, but we're going to make sure that it's taken care of in the years to come. Even these episodes like Jaws Context, it's going to explain at the end of this episode, I'm going to explain how all of this is part of that puzzle. With that, let's jump over to the announcement. We had a contest last week, a Book of Quint giveaway contest, where we had a trivia contest at the end of episode 51. And what is the company that makes Hooper's scuba tank? Why pick three when you can pick five? So we picked five winners. So congratulations to Chris in McDonald, Pennsylvania, film student Oleg in Ukraine, Jared in Waxhaw, North Carolina, Corey in Sunapee, New Hampshire, and Rick in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Congratulations to all five of you. A book of Quint has been shipped out. They were shipped out a few days ago, so they're well on their way. Congratulations to Chris, Oleg, Jared, Corey, and Rick. Thank you very much for participating. They all wrote in with the correct answer, which was the Aqualung U.S. Divers Aluminum Scuba Tank. We had emails that came in, and uh, one of the emails was from Sam, who was a Book of Quint backer. So he was ineligible for the contest because he already has. He, He wrote in, hey there, Ryan, just wanted to let you know the book arrived safe and sound a couple of weeks ago. I'm having such a great time diving into the book. Haven't finished it yet, but it's truly a work of passion and art. Also off the topic, the type of scuba tank Hooper used was an Aqualung U.S. Divers aluminum cylinder. I'm aware that I'm exempt from the raffle, but I thought I'd share these photos of what I believe to be original U.S. Divers catalog featuring the tank and Hooper's wetsuit. Best wishes, Sam. So yeah, thanks, Sam. And uh, so what I did was I will be putting those, uh, two of those, uh, those, these old advertise these older advertisements onto our show notes at Telegram channel at Jaws OB. So if you go to Telegram, just type in Jaws OB, the two ads will be on there. What I found interesting was uh, it just didn't come in silver. You had a yellow, black, a a nice blue tank. So there was silver, blue, black, and yellow uh, U.S. diver aluminum tanks, which uh, look really cool. The advertisements are neat. You, the original U.S. Divers Aluminum. Don't settle for less. Buy the originals. U.S. Divers Aluminum. Uh, Jacques Cousteau, chairman of the board. So they were located at 3323 West Warner Avenue, Santa Ana, California. Very cool to see. And then the other advertisement that he has is the U.S. Divers wetsuits. And you can see the one with the blue sleeves. 
in on one of the models that he has the uh, Hooper. Uh, let's see, that's Sea Diver Two. So that's uh, that's the name of the wetsuit that Hooper has. I think that's really cool. So he sent. So Sam sent us those advertisements, and I'll put those on our show notes as well. I also put one on the announcement when I took a picture of the five books that were going to be sent out on the Instagram. So if you go to Instagram at Book of Quint, you can see pictures of the uh, books that were sent out, the five books for our five contest winners. What that that's really cool. So what great times we're doing we're doing a lot of, we're having a lot of fun. We're doing old time radio giveaways, you know, just like uh, Ovaltine with the Dakota rings from Christmas story. Does anybody watch that? Did anybody? <laughs> and now the book of Quint has gained five more readers. So Steve writes in, uh, thanks so much, Ryan. My book from the cracked bean just arrived and I can't wait to jump into it. I saw the note on the inside. Is it true? You only printed 300. That's crazy. And I'll tell you this should, this should, and will be huge. Love the podcast. And I'm sure, and I'm sure I'm going to love the book. Thank you, sir. Steve from Wallington, New Jersey. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for writing in. And uh, yes, that was only 300 of those were made. And we are down to the final boxes. And they're over at the Cracked Bean Coffee Roastery, of which uh, Michelle is shipping them out. So if you go to the link in the description of this broadcast on whatever platform you're listening on, you will be able to find the link to the merchandise page over at uh, Cracked Bean Coffee Roastery. And if the supplies are still there, you'll be able to buy a book. And yes, there's only 300. And this was a, a limited edition printing of the Book of Quint to satisfy the Indiegogo campaign. Kept it very limited to entice a publisher to sign on to the book. Then it will be a publisher will be able to have the world premiere main launch of the Book of Quint. I was advised that to not, you don't want to water that down, but you have to give incentive for a publisher to say, okay, I will invest that money into sending these books out because the publisher is going to have to invest the capital in order to make that print happen. And then they're going to want to see a return. So I am hoping that this flows right into the publishing realm or into a wider release with a larger publishing house. So that's why there's only 300. And I'm glad you were able to get a book, Steve. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. So then Jim writes in from Connecticut. Jim writes in from Connecticut, says, Ryan, through the cracked bean, I got my copies of the book of Quint. Can't wait to crack into mine this weekend and likely won't be able to put it down. I've nervously skipped over the episodes where you've had excerpts and chapters read so I don't spoil it for myself. And oddly, if I heard someone else read it, it may cast a different version than how I'd see it as I read. So I didn't want to skew that for myself. I never knew how much of a Jaws fan I was till I started listening to your podcast and now it consumes me. So let me just pause right there. Uh, uh, Jim touched on the crack bean. He got, he, he bought two copies, one for a friend of his and one for him from crack bean. We have to appreciate what Michelle did for us as the official coffee of the Jaws obsession, the crack bean coffee roastery in Syracuse, New York. Michelle allowed me to free up part of my brain because there's a lot more going on. She said, Ryan, let me take care of the shipping of these books. And then she was able to add it to her website to where proper shipping charges could be applied and all that. We have Michelle to thank for that because it's allowing me to focus on the areas that I have to now, in or, not only in order to get the book into a wider publication. My time is only so limited with I have my career. So thank you very much to Michelle. If everybody wanted to go support her, go buy a bag of her coffee. She has a great Brazilian coffee over there. Uh, all her stuff is great. It's amazing. She, I just got a tour of their roastery. Her and Glenn over there are just unbelievable. They make great coffee. So if anybody's in the market or wants to try it out, send Michelle a big thank you note for what she's doing in order to uh, advance the book of Quint into readers' hands. <clears throat> now, this is really interesting. Jim says, I was thinking the other day, the 3000 bounty back in 1974, that, that was a lot of money. Today, it's around $18,000. Uh, Mrs. Kittner, where did she come up with that money and cycle the news so fast that in a day the whole eastern seaboard is knocking on Amity's door? I wonder, especially with Amity having an in-house shark hunter, Quint, why wouldn't you keep it quiet and just go to Quint? Wouldn't Mrs. Kittner just walk to Quint and say, help me, and he'd oblige? 
Now that's very interesting. First, we have to look at the uh, Jaws Obsession episode 16, Jaws Timeline Explained. On that episode with the Jaws Timeline, we actually had at the official Jaws movie timeline calendar that John Tedder helped me with. So what we had was we had the uh, Alex Kittner attack was on June the 29th. The town hall meeting was on June the 30th. Michael Brody's birthday was not shown. That was July 1st. And then we have Hooper arrives on, and so do all the fishermen on July 2nd. So we have one, two, we had two, we had Monday and Tuesday for her to run that ad by Monday. We had the print would have went out Monday night. Then they would have had print Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening. And by Wednesday morning, July 2nd, that's when all the fishermen arrive. So it's not one day. There is actually two days between the Alex Kittner attack and then um, on that third day, which was July 2nd, was when all the fishermen were showing up. So that makes it a little bit more realistic in terms of the, the news cycle, pumping it out there. And when everybody, all the out-of-state plates were showing up, it wasn't just one day. It was actually, it was on the third day that they were showing up. But what's interesting, the 3,000 bounty, yes, that's a lot of money. The way I see it is, and, and I think we could do a whole episode on Mrs. Kittner. There's a lot of clues in there as to exactly who she was on the island, or she used to be an islander, but she moved away and she was back there visiting. I don't want to go too much into Mrs. Kittner, but what we have is the, his question was, um, I wonder, especially with Amity having a, an in-house shark hunter, it's possible that she did not know about Quint because it's established in the book of Quint that there's almost two societies on the island. On the east side of the island is the town of Amity. On the west side is Amity Point. And that's where all the uh, rough and tough fishermen, that's where the Amity Point is pretty much where Quint's shark and shack is. And that's where a lot of the... Um, the, the lower class people are on the west side, the west side of the island. And then the, a lot of the money and the old, old money that's on the island is on the east side in the town. So if, in, in the book of Quint, there's an actual a map of Amity Island. And that lets you see the explanation of what that island's topography looks like as well as the layout between the, um, the two ends. And that's why I think that her first way, her first is just to go right to the newspapers because she has money. And I think that the 3000 bounty was nothing for her. But as Jim is going to find out when he reads the book of Quint, there's so much more going on that that is going to all be answered. All your questions about what's the mayor have to do with it and all that, that's all going to be answered when Jim reads the book of Quint. And I'm excited if when he, when he writes back, what he's going to realize is that there is a there is an entire narrative arc that leads into that moment. And the Mrs. Kittner is that X factor that the mayor never would have planned on. I don't believe there's any conspiracy on the Kitt Mrs. Kittner side. That was just a natural reaction of a mother that wants revenge. It's very interesting. If everybody reads the book of Quint, all these little questions, they kind of get smoothed over because there are a lot of elements in Jaws that are not answered. There's a lot of little things that just get smoothed over and you never hear about them again. Trust me, there's so much more information to learn of these side characters, which is why I'm seeing, even though I'm supposed to be working on the Book of Quint rollout, the, the door is open and I'm still, I still don't want to leave Amity Island in terms of writing. I think there's so much more to talk about on Amity Island. So with that, let's move to Jaws context. Jaws context is what, so we have to, let's establish what context is. And that's what we're going to do right now. Okay, so the definition of context, uh, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, the definition of context is the situation within which something exists or happens, and that can help explain it. Another definition from the American Dictionary would be the influences and events related to a particular event or situation. So the influences or events. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, context is uh, the second definition for context would be the circumstances in which an event occurs, a setting. 
Okay, so the circumstances. Last week we talked about Jaws subtext, which is the emotional or the hidden layer that's underneath what words are being spoken or words that are not being spoken. Actions speak louder than words, and that's usually that's what subtext leads to, and that's what Jaws does so well. So we talked about subtext, but you cannot have subtext without context. So you you can't have a nervous Brody. You're watching him get on the board the the orca, and you know that he doesn't like boats. Why do we know that? Because we have the context was applied. We were given the contextual material of the dinner scene, okay? So we had, we had context that was given when uh, Alan Brody describes Martin's fear of the water. Those were all peppered in. Bad Hat Harry saying, we all know about you, Chief. So all of that was peppered in to give context, which leads to subtext later on. And that's what I think is fascinating about what Jaws does. It peppers in context without hitting you over the head with it. There are little moments there where you can derive something later on. If you did not have those little moments, if, if those little moments that Spielberg did not focus on or did not exist, and many of these little moments are not even in the screenplay, okay? So this was Steven Spielberg, and he's going to get, this is where he's going to get the credit here. This was Steven Spielberg sitting off to the side, blocking out this in his mind, and just, and then working with his actors when they were doing run-throughs on the scene, and they, he just said, why don't you try it like this? And then it just worked. So there's two things I wanted to focus on in Jaws. One is we're going to focus on Hooper here. We're, we are on now to the Jaws context. We, we're, at, we're actually going to focus on areas of the movie that layer in, that lay down, a, uh, that, that lay down some sort of context where later on something is going to be more, it will be more subtextually significant because of these scenes. So here we have on the dock, they just caught the tiger shark. What kind of a shark is it? I don't know. I think it's a macaw. Got a deep throat, Brad. Yeah, well, but what kind? What kind of shark? Tiger shark. A what? Do we talk? Uh, fantastic. We love that guy. We love a uh, what, right? We love that. So what we have is we have Hooper. He says it's a tiger shark. These guys that caught it don't even know what species of shark it is. A what? We can start breathing again. Then get Here, it, it, here it is. Right. Oh, your bet he is. What is this bite radius what, crap? That is a what big mouth. Look at all it. I'm trying to I'm going to stuff your freaking head in there, man, and hey, find out if it's a man. All right? Let's right. 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 stuff it. Come on. Okay, so we have Matt Hooper he gets into an altercation with the fisherman. He's talking very scientific terms. He's talking about bite radius, and he's just saying some of these ideas, and these guys totally start bullying him. The one guy's in the back blowing in his ear. Intimidating fishermen are intimidating Matt Hooper, who's the scientist of it all, but Matt Hooper has more nautical knowledge than any of these guys. But what's happening is, is that he's totally getting intimidated by this. And that's when it flips to the next shot. He now slides into the frame, basically saying he doesn't want to get beaten up. This is not a shark. All right, what I am saying is that it may not be a shark. It's just a slight oh, and I want such a freezing uh, semantics that I don't want to get beaten up. This is uh, Larry Vaughn on there. Match from the ocean. Right. Now we know that he's pretty much getting pushed away from the shark by these fishermen. They're being very aggressive. So he's, he's an outsider on the island. He's obviously looking at these, uh, and let's see what Matt Hooper says. How does he describe the fishermen? Does anybody know? Nice to meet you. Martin, there are all kinds of sharks in the waters, you know? Hammerheads, white tips, blues, makos. And the chances that these bozos got the exact oh, shark. There's no other sharks like this Martin, in these waters. It's 100 to 1. 100 to 1. See, so he says these bozos, which is Bozo the Clown. He's calling them clowns. He knows that these guys are weekend warriors. They're not even real fishermen. They don't even know what they caught. Now, this is the context of what we're looking at here. So now when we fast forward into the movie later on, and we're not going to get into that fully because we talked about this in episodes 35 and 36, Time Me a Sheepshank and the father and son dynamic that I believe is going on between Matt Hooper and Quint later on, is that is the subtext that I derived that from. This is the context is laid that Matt Hooper is, not only is he knowledgeable, 
not only does he know his business about um, marine biology, but also fishing and sailing as well, because we saw him talk about the sailing boat. And he says, you're just going to luff it. And he gives the instructions to the guy to get out of there. So we know Matt Hooper can handle himself on a boat. We all that we so we know about this. And these are the that's this is the context that Jaws applies. So later on, when Matt Hooper confronts Quint and is in that moment where Quint is pushing back and Matt Hooper is pushing back on Quint, that is now a little bit more realistic because of what he went through with these fishermen over here. Only the difference is Matt Hooper sees that Quint knows his sharks, knows his fishing, knows his nautical knowledge. And therefore, Matt Hooper now is more, in, he, he's now looking at that in an intimidating way as a father figure. Quint is a father figure. He is not seeing these guys as father figures whatsoever. These guys are bozos. So that's what makes the Quint shark and shack scene so much better is that we are given the context at the beginning of Jaws with what Matt Hooper deals with average, ordinary fishermen that have no idea what they're doing. Wonderful. That's Jaws context. Okay, Jaws context leads to Jaws subtext. If you want to learn more about that subtext, go to episode 35 and 36, and that is, that's where the subtext is brought out from this context that we have here. Let's do another one. We're going to go to the mayor, Mr. Mayor. The, on the title card of this episode, I used the mayor walking into the council chambers with the cigarette in his mouth, the fake cigarette. That is a fake cigarette. I'm going to make a judgment call on that. I don't believe it's a real cigarette because there's one scene where it looks like the filter is completely solid brown on the end. It doesn't have the... Um, the brown end of the cigarette doesn't have the white of the filter. And as you see, sometimes the cigarette looks hollow, but it looks like it's white on the end. That would happen to be is what I believe those are. The cigarette the mayor has through most of the movie. It looks like an unlit, cig unlit cigarette. He has it in the fairy scene. Summer dollars. If the people can't swim here, they'll be glad to swim at the beaches of Cape Cod, the Hamptons, Long Island. That doesn't mean we have to serve them up a smorgasbord. We have the mayor with holding it in his right hand on the ferry ride with Chief Brody. Then he is walking into the council down the corridor of Amity Town Hall. He puts it in his mouth. So where he's drawing on this fake cigarette. Now there's a couple of brands that are out there. One is called Achieve. Uh, to quit smoking, you don't light the cigarette. You actually just in, you just breathe the essential oils that are on the end, and you take a drag. It's supposed to be for someone that's quitting smoking. Were these around in night? Was the brand Achieve around in nineteen seventy four? I don't. I'm not sure, but I believe there were other types of cigarettes out there. There's another brand called Harmless Cigarettes. So the Harmless Cigarette is a pure and natural therapeutic quit smoking aid. It replicates similar features of a regular cigarette and can be used to simulate smoking, which can help satisfy cravings, distract you from getting smoking cravings, overcome smoking behaviors such as oral fixation, hand-to-mouth gestures, and curb many other habits associated with smoking. So how long were harmless cigarettes or the Achieve Quit Smoking cigarette out? Were they around in the 70s? Uh, this is what I believe it is. I heard an interview with Sammy Davis Jr. once. I can't find it for this episode, but I remember him saying that he had the biggest problem even because he was so addicted to smoking and it became part of his act, part of his mannerisms when he was on stage about the lighting of the cigarette, the holding of the hand and the hand motions and the gestures that he didn't know what to do with his hands when he was told he had to quit smoking. So it was very uncomfortable for him. So what I think is this is the mayor that has been pushed to quit smoking. He is trying to quit smoking, and that's why he has this harmless cigarette or this uh, Achieve anti-cigarette smoking aid in his hand throughout almost the entire movie. Uh, on the ferry ride, you have him uh, going into the council chambers. 
at the billboard scene. So you have the mayor with this smokeless cigarette at the bill at those three scenes. What that is, that's context. So that is now dropping in context that we have the mayor is used to be a smoker and he's actively trying to quit smoking. What I'm going to need everybody in the some of the experts out there in the Jaws obsession, uh, what brand of smokeless cigarette was he using? I'd like to know. And did they have those around in 1974? I believe they did. Was this added by Murray Hamilton? Was this actively something Murray Hamilton was doing, trying to quit smoking while the making of Jaws and Spielberg just said, hey, that's pretty cool. Why don't we throw that in? Uh, There won't be any continuity errors with the length of ash or length of cigarette that other scenes will have when you have someone smoking a real cigarette. So did Spielberg like that and say, let's leave it in there? What's really interesting is because these these sequences where he's drawing on the cigarette, he's only drawing on it when he's getting more and more agitated. He obviously was drawing on the cigarette when walking down the corridor. This is a great white, Larry, a big one. And any shark expert in the world will tell you it's a killer, it's a man-eater. Look, the situation is that apparently a great white shark has staked a claim in the waters off Amity Island. And he is going to continue to feed here as long as there is food in the water. And there's no limit to what he's going to do. I mean, we've already had three incidents. Two people killed inside of a week, and it's going to happen again. Yeah, he's even walking up to the billboard with uh, Hooper and Brody, and he's drawing on that cigarette. And you can clearly see there is no tobacco in the end. That's either a hollow end or a plastic end. So what he's doing is he's drawing on that smokeless cigarette uh, but you can see that he's agitated. So it, it, it's working that in to that uh, for his character that's adding subtext in. We don't need to get in. We don't need to hear him say he's just agitated, uh, that something's going on. So what's happening is, is that he wants to go back to his original self, right? So this was the mayor, actually. He used to be quite the smoker, as you see in the book of Quint. So what happens is now is he's going back. He needs to go back to the old Mayor Vaughn. This new Mayor Vaughn where he was trying to quit smoking, maybe turn a page, is not working. He's getting agitated, so he's taking more draws on that smokeless cigarette. Now that's what's leading us to. Everybody knows the scene later on. Because you're going to do what you do best. You're going to sign this voucher so I can hire a contractor. I, I don't I don't know if I can do that without... Uh... I'm going to hire Quint to kill the shark. At the hospital scene now, he's actually smoking a real cigarette. Of course, we all know that that is outlandish now by today's standards. But in 1974, or when the movie came out in 1975, you see him smoking a cigarette. It wouldn't mean much if you didn't have the context of the smokeless cigarette, the fake cigarette, through the whole movie. So now he's totally set, thrown caution to the wind. We know now it, there's he's basically going to be exposed. What's going to be exposed? Well, we have to read the book of Quint to find that out. But the thing is, is that this is not, you're the mayor of Shark City. These people think you want the beaches open. I believe the mayor is not worried about that in the slightest. He can sidestep that with the best of them because he is a career politician and he's an exceptional politician at that. What we, what Brody doesn't know is that Quint's going to be brought into the picture now. And what Quint knows is going to be very damaging to the mayor. And that's why he's smoking the real cigarette. So it's more powerful at this scene because he's smoking the real cigarette. That's the subtext. The subtext is the real cigarette. It's the result of the context that the entire movie has laid for us. That's Jaws' context. And that's what's so remarkable about that. All these little uh, magical moments lead up to something that there's something bigger is going on. What a prequel does for Jaws, on its face, on its merit, it's establishing context, more context, And that's going to lead to more subtext in the movie Jaws. That's what a proper prequel was supposed to do. That's why people will leave the theater disappointed. Why they were leaving the theater disappointed, I'm going to use the example of the Star Wars prequels, is because there wasn't enough context being laid down where you would watch the original movies and then 
have a new enjoyment or discover something new. There would be new subtextual significance going on because of the context that was laid out in the prequels. That was missing there. And by and large, that was, that was entirely missing. And that's what we're doing here with the Book of Quint, is that the context that the Book of Quint creates now creates an, a, an entire new world of subtext just by watching Jaws. Jaws doesn't have to be remade, doesn't have to be rebooted. It doesn't even need to be reissued. You just watch the issue, watch Jaws that you have, the one that you enjoy right now. You might enjoy it in DVD, Blu-ray, 4K. Any way you enjoy it now, it can be enjoyed if there's more context added. And that's what we're doing with the Book of Quint. So with that, I hope everyone gets a chance and we're going to work very hard so everybody has access to the Book of Quint this year. And we're going to be, next year at this time, we're going to be having full-on episodes about the Book of Quint and what exactly does it reveal in Jaws. And those are going to be remarkable. So I look forward to those episodes. But for now, I hope you enjoyed uh, episode 52, Jaws Context. Show me the way to go. I'm tired. One more reminder on over at Etsy.com at Quint's Shark and Shack. If you follow the links in the description of this broadcast, John Tedder still has his discount code Jaws OB for Jaws Obsession listeners to get 25% off your entire order. That is good until the beginning of February. Um, so if anybody wants to have any uh, Jaws memorabilia or anything that John offers over there, he's fully stocked. Please go over to Quince Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. Follow the link in this broadcast description and enter the code JAWSOB. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. Copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyrighted Act. All rights reserved to the copyright owners. Special thanks again to Crack Bean Coffee Roastery. Follow the links, go over to their merchandise page, get yourself a book of Quint, and start reading. We have a lot of great things that we'll be talking about in future episodes. And uh, if we all read the Book of Quint, they'll be able to be revealed in full. We are now on Instagram. Go to Instagram at Book of Quint for the latest and greatest and latest news. Thank you very much for listening this week. Remember, you can always write in at JawsOB2025 at gmail.com, JawsOB.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell and adieu, and show me the way to go home. Mm-hmm.